Welcome to the Lorecast. I'm Dr. Craig Chalquist, looking at the stories by which we deeply live. I'm going to lead off with a bold statement. I've come to believe that the biggest problems in our world today, and perhaps for thousands of years, today we've got climate chaos, warfare, intolerance, poverty, greed, you name it. The list goes on and on. I believe that all of them come down to being stuck to the gods. So let's look at a few examples of what that actually means. Starting with what it doesn't mean, which is uh, it doesn't mean having a particular intellectual conception of a divine power that you then allow to rule your life although it can include that. Atheists can be stuck to their gods. Agnostics can be stuck to their gods. People in business, people in politics, people in religion, none of the above. Everybody can be stuck to their gods. What does that mean? So a few examples. Uh, a while back I knew somebody who saw the entirety of life through the lens of justice. And justice of course, is a very positive thing. We need a lot more of it in the world rather than less. But what I mean is um, judgmentalism, moralizing, finger pointing, somebody always having to be to blame, somebody always having to be punished, that kind of an orientation. And of course, many people suffer from that. So if we think of justice, as archetypal, we might begin to understand what's going on here psychologically. Now, I won't get into a huge discussion about archetypes, um, which are conceptualized in various ways by different people. Even Jung didn't stay the same about how he thought of archetypes. So let's keep this simple and just say that there are basic structural principles that govern us, the psyche, the world, even the cosmos, that you find everywhere. And I don't mean the supposed archetypes of kings and queens and so on that appear in some of the early Jungian writings. I actually don't think those are archetypes. There's certainly European roles of nobility and aristocracy. Um, there's many societies that do without those. But the leader might be an archetype, because you see that just about everywhere, including among animals. And there are many different styles of leadership. So I accept that the leader position is archetypal, because you see it everywhere. You see some version of love everywhere. Love is archetypal. There is some version of fairness or justice everywhere. Not just human. Uh, I'm reminded of a story where a researcher had a dolphin in a tank. And he wanted to study this old idea that when human beings get into trouble and are drowning, then dolphins will sometimes help us by bringing us to the surface, which seems to indicate that they realize we breathe. So he set up a camera, went out to the deep part of the tank, and thrashed around like he was drowning. And the dolphin swam up, and sure enough, she got underneath him, lifted him to the surface of the water so he could breathe. And he went, great. But then he realized he left the lens cap on the camera. <laughs> so he repeated the experiment with the lens cap off. This time, when he thrashed about, the dolphin swam up to him, and smacked him on the back with her flukes and swam away to another side of the pool. Now, keep in mind that dolphins are extremely powerful. She could easily have killed him by slapping him like that. So she seemed to be aware that he was pretty fragile and just gave him enough of a shock to hurt him a little bit. And he interpreted that as being punished for faking a life or death situation. She was aware that he was faking it and she gave him a little slap on the back. 
So we could find other examples in the natural world, but it seems like justice is archetypal, and we can call it equality, justice, fairness, what have you. It looks different in different cultures. It looks different in different individuals across species and so on. So another word for these archetypes is gods. And many gods exemplify archetypal qualities, so there are often gods of justice, gods of love, different kinds of love, actually. Gods of authority, trickster gods, death and rebirth gods, uh, because resurrection is an archetype. Whenever there's a big mass movement that leads to revolution or political upheaval, or perhaps a new religion, something else that's new under the sun, usually at the center of it is an activated archetype that appeals to millions who get entranced by it. Right now there's some archetypes that play in American politics. One of them is the Golden Age when things were beautiful and peaceful and abundant and wonderful. And this archetype is going by the name for millions of people of Make America Great Again. Promulgated by a trickster. And the thing about activated archetypes is that they are, even the archetype of justice, they are amoral. They just are. They're facts of nature. And so when they occur, when they uh, constellate, as Jung said, how they show up depends on the consciousness of the people who are involved. And so if you're unconscious that something bigger than you has seized you, it often goes badly. And the archetype will show up very shadowy indeed, and even destructive and harmful. There are negative tricksters. There are shadowy sociopathic tricksters, as well as funny ones who do good things in the world. A person possessed by the archetype of justice, without realizing that they are, can be extremely punitive. And there's a lot of moralizing and judging and blaming and finger pointing involved. They're really a pain to be around. You constantly feel like you're on trial. And they may have no background in the legal arena whatsoever. Although there are some people, I've met some of them, who are involved with, say, the, the courts, who are possessed by the archetype of justice, and many who are not. I was in court a while ago representing the men in one of my programs that dealt with um, batterer intervention and teaching nonviolent skills, relationship and communication skills. Worked a lot with the courts. Um, I went to court every Tuesday for a few years representing the men in my programs. And um, they would meet with the judge. And if they did well, they got praised in court. And so this particular judge was one of the ones who, of course, upheld justice, but she was not possessed by the archetype of justice. She was still human <laughs> and even had a sense of humor. And so there was this one guy who was about to graduate from our program. Um, all the men in our program had been incarcerated at some point, uh, jail or prison. And when they came out, they came to us. So um, in one court session, the judge had been quite frustrated with this man early on and said, if you, if you ever graduate from this program, sir, I will stand up from the bench here and do a dance. So a year later, he got himself together. He did everything he needed to do, and he was ready to graduate. So we were in court, and the judge said, you have really turned it around. You have really done well. Um, the reports from Counselor Chalquist here say that you are doing great on all, on all counts. You got your fines paid off. We're ready to actually graduate you. So well done. And then she sat down, and um, I said, I believe your honor stated about a year ago that if this client actually graduated, that you were going to do something special in court. Do you remember that? And she did. 
Um, she said, thank you for reminding me. And she stood up and she did a little happy dance for him. <laughs> and everybody clapped. This was in Superior Court. Right? I'd never seen a happy dance in Superior Court before. From the standpoint of Carl Jung's work, an archetype is the psychological motive power behind what we call gods. So when we talk about gods, it, it, psychologically, these aren't metaphysical statements. There's no position on whether they actually exist or not metaphysically. But they certainly exist psychologically. And when you think about people who come to tragic ends who are public figures, sometimes you can identify the, act, the god who they seem to be stuck to. I often think of um, Marilyn Monroe and Venus in that connection. I think Venus was in some ways her personal myth, the myth she was living. But the problem is that it lived her. She let it get control of her because she didn't have any capacity to stand back from it and just be herself. When George W. Bush was president, starting wars, he seemed a lot like Ares to me. The kind of bumbling war god who always got himself into trouble. And um, got knocked on his ass a few times, even by Athena, who wouldn't put up with his nonsense. President Obama, in terms of his style, often struck me like uh, a god like Apollo. Reason, emotional distance, let's have everything be harmonious. Of course, Apollo is the god of health care. So behind human doings um, and behaviors, you can often see the presence of something archetypal happening. So in my fiction, I've taken this idea and run with it. And, um, and at the same time, trying to provide a bit of an archetypal education that we don't get in most schools. I've been providing it at the, at the graduate level for a long time. Um, schools like Pacifica Graduate Institute provide it, and other programs as well, um, schools and programs. But it's still pretty rare. You don't see it at grade school or high school, for instance. And so in my fiction... The, the complete cycle of stories is called the Assembling Terrania Cycle. And Terrania is my word for the good society that I firmly believe we are capable of building. I think that one of the tasks in front of us is to become responsible and mature human beings, which many of us already are, but the majority of us, probably not. We have our work cut out for us. And so in the cycle, it starts very early in history and it goes all the way forward to when we finally achieve Terrania, which is not utopia, by the way. We're not capable of utopia. We're just human beings. But we can have a good society where people are safe and where diversity is prized and where abundance is available. So there's a little bit of the, um, a little bit of the Golden Age archetype shining there, but I try not to get possessed by it keeping firmly aware of the limitations. And it's a long struggle. It's called The Long Adventure in my fiction, and it's a really long adventure with many setbacks. And I refer to the archetypes in my fiction as the powers, with a capital P. So there's strife and love and other ones who are on the scene. But it's humans who make the decisions, ultimately, which is how it is in life. And so as the powers themselves say, in the stories that I write, they want us to relate to them as um, adults, psychological adults. They don't want us to worship them. They don't want us to ignore them, which only invites them to possess us unconsciously. They don't need offerings. They need conversation. They need respect. And to be played with a little bit. And you especially see that in the trickster power, Clooney. And um, he's got a, a story to himself called Devil's Do. He narrates the story. And by the way, the, the first collection of these stories is free. It's at chalkwist.com slash fiction. 
and I've put them together into a collection called Tales of Terrania Rising, so you can have those for free. Um, I published a novel last year, which is the first of three novels in the series, called Soul Mapper. And the powers are in there as well, and Clooney's in there too. But in the free collection, uh, Devil's Do is the story where he talks about himself. And um, he starts by saying, the name's Clooney, and he spells it. And he says, make sure you get it right. And he says, actually, I don't care if you get it right. <laughs> I'm called a million things on a million worlds. You know? And he gives a few examples of those. So, whatever the archetypal style of each of these powers, what's necessary is to become conscious of their presence and to not open a dialogue, because we're always already in dialogue with them, but to step into it consciously. And we can do this through active imagination. As Jung showed us, we can do it in art, fantasy, fiction, literature, daydreaming, fantasizing, many different ways. Some people go on plant medicine journeys. There are different different ways to do this, to talk to the powers. And when you mix in some self-reflection, then you begin acquiring the ability to step back from them instead of being possessed by them. So when James Hillman published his book, A Terrible Love of War, he wrote a piece in the beginning of it where he said, this is a book about war, so I'm standing at the altar of Mars. So in that way, he makes conscious the tone that he's using and as well as the content that he's talking about instead of simply being possessed by Mars and acting out that possession. So with self-reflection, we can ask questions like, where am I compulsive? And what are my current obsessions? What's my style when I get under pressure? What, do I, what am I preoccupied with to the exclusion of things that are important? What do I keep revisiting and going back to? These, plus a study of mythology, can help us begin to understand where it is that we stop and bigger powers start. Because they get into us through our weaknesses, through our personal weaknesses. There were many men in my groups who were possessed either by Mars or by the uh, archetype of the hero. They wanted to save everybody, which, of course, continually got them into trouble. The hero barges in, doesn't, doesn't ask for permission, just, we're going to do this, and pushes and shoves and strives for victory, competes with other people, and then rides out of town. So it's not a serviceable psychology for getting along with other people. I would say that, by and large, American culture, um, or I should say United States culture, is addicted to the hero. We're stuck to the hero. With horrible consequences. Personal, national, and international. The hero is something that we've had with us since colonial days, and we seem unwilling to give it up. And it's hurting us and everybody else, too. In my early 30s, when I was very much possessed by the hero archetype. I wanted to go out sea kayaking near Oxnard, and I took my kayak out there, buckled on my gear, at which point a dog ran all the way down the deserted beach and barked ferociously, positioning itself between me and the water. That had never happened to me before. So I sat down for a moment, and as I listened to the waves, I noticed that they were really big dumpers, meaning it was hard to get out and get in and there had been a storm recently, and the hero part of me said, I can go out there and do it. Never mind those. And the other part said, but what if you don't come back? So I consciously stepped out of hero psychology, put my equipment away, and went home. Who knows what would have happened if I had stayed possessed. But stepping back from the gods isn't a one-time-only activity. It's, it's a constant inquiry into... What archetypal position do I occupy right now in this decision-making, in this behavior, in my style of doing stuff? What archetypal presence is here? And when we begin to understand that, we begin to make renewed contact, not only with our own humanity and with the powers, but with other human beings as well. Our relationships become humbler, deeper, and more realistic, and more peaceful. 
though. It would make me happy if someday, let's say in high school, they started offering a course called Archetypal Depossession. Because I think that maybe we all need it. Thank you.